our folks that's here with us tonight. I also want to thank those that are tuning in in social media. I'd like to take my opening text scripture tonight found in the book of Psalms, chapter number 95. And it says this, O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Oh, praise God. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and great king above all gods. Aren't you thankful today that God's still alive and well and breathing in our hearts and our lives. Oh, praise God that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are the true, is the true and living God, three in one, actively working in our lives. Can you say amen? Hallelujah to God. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you, God, for your goodness, your kindness. Lord, your peace, your love, and your mercy, dear God. Lord, we thank you, dear God, that we can call upon you, dear God, the Lord of our salvation, dear God, our rock and our fortress, Lord. Father, we thank you, God, that we can come boldly before you tonight, oh God. Thanking you, God, for everything good in our lives, dear God. And no matter, Lord, if there's anything that's wrong in our lives, dear God, we don't thank you for it, Lord. But we thank you, dear God, that you bring us through every situation, dear God. And Lord, we never want to fail to give you praise give you glory oh praise God we thank you for your spirit that's here tonight God in Jesus mighty name amen amen if you have offering tonight I'd like for them to post it up here on how to give uh, you can give by cash check make it out to Will and Vessels Christian Center uh, you can go to willandvessels.org and type in give text any dollar amount and uh, if you have anything you can bring it up here and put it in tonight We'll turn it over to Sister Brittany. On the peaceful shore, very deeply stain within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters he lifted me, now safe am I. To him I'll cling Here in his blessed presence live Ever his praises sing Love so mighty, love so true Merits my soul's best songs Faithful love and service to To Jesus completely saves. He will lift you by his love and of the angry waves. He's the master of the sea, 
Below his will obey. He a savior wants to be. Be saved today. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. When Okay, you guys can sit down. Is this live? Is this on? Okay. I hear myself, sort of, but. Okay, that's good. That's good, I think. Anyway, thank you, Brittany. You know, love is the only thing that could help. You know, when we were lost and undone, lost away from uh, the Father, away from Christ, He's the only one. Love came in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, didn't he? And went to the cross for, and died for our sin and reconciled us to the Father. So, anyway, welcome again. Other brother John, welcome to everybody, but welcome again to the people that's online and everybody that's here tonight. Uh, the crowd's kind of small tonight. Maybe more will come in. Hey, Joni. Um, I know it's hot and people are on vacation and and, but uh, we're taking time to come to the house of God tonight to share his word. Uh, before, we, before we get started, and I'll try not to keep you very long tonight. Um, before we get started, though, I, I want to pray. And I was going to wait, but I, I feel I really sense the need to pray right now uh, for uh, Sister Sherry and her, her mom. And uh, I know there, Brother Joe said they're not expecting her to live, and I uh, think that's their desire. She's just ready to go home. So um, when we pray, we like to pray and pray and intercede for the things that people want, people need, and that's her desire. It's the best thing for her to go home, and that's the way we'll pray, that the Lord will just take her on and uh, and she'll meet, and he'll meet her there in glory. She go peacefully, and to give the family peace and comfort. And that's one of the things that the Holy Ghost does. He gives us comfort and peace. He's the Comforter. Jesus said, "I'll send another Comforter when I go to return to the Father." Um, so let's pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, the name above every name. We we come to you. We come to the throne of grace. We thank you that we can come. We can come with confidence, boldly, Lord God. And we just thank you, Lord God, that um, we have the confidence, Father, because you've given us that blessed assurance. You give us the assurance, and you come to live in, inside of us by the Holy Ghost. We have the living God inside of us, and that's when we can come to you, Father, in, in faith, Lord. And we do ask you, Lord, for Sister Sherry's mom just to give her peace and just to just to grant her desires to go home and just to grant the family, uh, Sister Sherry, Brother Tony, and all the family, Father, we ask you, Lord, just to give them peace and comfort, the whole family. I pray that there be no, be no pain, be no pain, but just, uh, just changing uh, locations, changing venues uh, to a better place, to be in glory, to be in heaven with you, Father, and we thank you for that. And we just, uh, we believe it, and we thank you, and we, give, we honor you, and give you praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, I hope, hope everybody's doing well. I think we're about to change microphones. Before I get tangled up here. 
Okay, that's better. Now, I have a little more freedom, but uh, I'll try not to get too far away here. Thank you, brother. Thank you, Autumn, or Alicia, whoever did that. Um, okay, turn to, uh, turn to Romans, turn to Romans uh, chapter 12, verse 1, um, if you would. It's a scripture that you're familiar with. You've heard pastor. I've heard him preach on it. Uh, he quotes it a lot. Uh, this is something that the Lord really laid on my heart at the midnight hour, literally. After, it was after midnight, I guess, last night. Because I had another message. I had another one I was going to actually teach. And this will be should be more teaching than preaching, too. Uh, try not to uh, try to control myself here. But anyway, everybody there said, I beseech Paul, this is uh, Apostle Paul uh, to the church at Rome. So I beseech you, therefore, I see, beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And, you know, reading this, it says, by the mercies of God. This is his favor. This is something that's new every day by his mercy he tells us to present us present ourselves as a living sacrifice and you know the sacrifice we could not do this without what Jesus did we would not have the ability to do this right here on our own it's all because of what he did at the cross what he accomplished there he shed his blood you know he 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 brought us back into a relationship with the Father. That's why we can be a living sacrifice, holy, which is his righteousness that he, he bought for us and gave to us and made us acceptable unto God. Without his shed blood, before Christ went to the cross, we were away from God. We could not approach him. You know, a lot of people in the world today think they, they can pray and think there, God hears them. Well, I got news for them. Unless they have been born again, God doesn't hear them. It's impossible. Because they have a thing called sin separating them from God. Until they, until they recognize that they are a sinner and, and repent, change of mind, and believe the gospel of their salvation. Believe in the shed blood, the shed blood on the cross, Jesus shed on the cross and the res his resurrection after three days, they can't have access. So they believe that and receive it by faith, then they can bo be born again, they'll be reconciled to God, then they are acceptable to God. That's the only way. I don't care who you are, Jew, Gentile alike. We all come, we all have to come the same way, can't we? Don't we? We all have to come through Christ, through the cross, through the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, we quote this all the time that, you know, there's um, Acts 4.12 said there's none other name, none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. For Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come up to the Father but by me. So, you know, we quoted it. Last time I was up here, I said the same thing. And I'll probably say it every time I'm up here because that's the truth. That's the reality. So to be acceptable to God, we have to come through Christ. There's only one. He said you've got to come through the door. Through the of the sheepfold, he is the door. He is the only door. He's the good shepherd. Okay. Um, verse two it says, "Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, and acceptable, and perfect will of God." There again, the same way. You know, we come through Christ. It's the only way we can be conformed to him and not to the world. You know, there's too many. As the Lord was speaking to me, he reminded me that there's too much. Not only the world, you know, the people that's out in the world, they don't know any better. I mean, that's just who they are. If you read, uh, I think it's Ephesians chapter 2, you know, that's just who they are. They serve their father, the devil. I mean, that's, that's who their father is. And that sounds kind of harsh. I know people out there, they say, what is he talking about? Well, it's the truth. If you're not born again, 
and you're separated from God. And your father is the devil, Satan. That's who he is. That's who you are. And but when you come to the Lord, when you come to God through the Lord Jesus Christ, then Jehovah, the God of Abraham, becomes your father. He's your father then and only then. So he says, be not conformed to this world. And this is an admonition to the church. This is an admonition to us, to the church there at Rome, and to us that we shouldn't be like the world. We shouldn't act. We shouldn't act like them. We shouldn't talk like them. We shouldn't be doing the things that they do. You know, we are, when you become a new creature, as I spoke a week before last, when you're born again, you come to Christ by faith, by grace through faith. You know, you're a new creation. You're a new creature. You're actually a new species. You're something this world has never seen before until that time, until the day of Pentecost. They've never seen anything like it. Satan had never seen anything like it. The angels had never seen anything like it. And don't think, just think about it. You know that shook Satan up. He was shook up bad enough because he didn't know what was going on. When Jesus said it's finished, he went to the cross. See, the devil thought he was done. So I got him now. I've defeated God finally. But no, the blood's been shed. And he said it's finished. When he said it's finished, he gave up the ghost. Then what happened? What happened to the veil? Anybody know? They're in the temple. There's old Caiaphas standing over there. And he thought, well, you know, he's all smug and got his shoulders thrown back there. He thought he'd really done something. He thought he said he was really honoring God. But all he did was serve up the lamb, the last sacrifice that he would serve up because the veil was rent, the Bible says, rent in twain, torn in two from the top to the bottom. The veil from the, from the separated men from the Holy of Holies, only the high priest could go in once a year. When that veil was torn in two, when that signified right then that we all, not only do we have access to the throne room, but that Jesus himself would become the great high priest. Hallelujah. He would become that great high priest. So Caiaphas was done. He didn't realize it. And he think he tore his vesture, didn't he? And he tore it. But that signified he was done. He was finished. He had no more authority. And I think, and they, I don't know what they did. I, I've never read the historical accounts, but I don't know if they kept doing the sacrifice or whatever. But I know that in 70 AD, on the 9th of Av, that Hebrew month, on the Hebrew calendar, the 9th of Av, what happened? I, mean, I imagine some of y'all can tell me. What happened in the 70 AD? It had happened one time before in history on that same date, on the 9th of Av. If Mike Bennett was here, he would tell you. What happened? No. The temple, the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. I mean, Jesus had prophesied this very thing would happen. The temple was destroyed in 70 AD on the 9th of Av. Okay? And... But before then, the temple was destroyed on that same date, a few thousand years before that. I won't get into all that. I didn't even mean to mention that. Anyway, living sacrifice. I hadn't even got to the main point here. For I say, the third verse says, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Now, this is a good point here in the, in the third verse from Paul saying here. It says not to think, he told the Romans there, not to think of themselves more highly than they ought to think. So not to be puffed up, not to be arrogant, not to be prideful. And, you know, that's, they had a tendency, you know, to do that. Uh, and sometimes, you know, pride, and I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit later, but, um, you know, it's becoming a living sacrifice. Let's get back to that before I get way off here and start chasing rabbits. Being a living sacrifice, what does that mean exactly? That's right. Surrender. It's being unselfish, isn't it? Selfless. Being unselfish. Putting others before yourself. Putting Christ first. Then put in your brothers, sisters. You know, that's why we're all here. And even more, you know, if you're married, and we have a we have a young couple here getting ready to 
take the plunge, is putting your spouse before yourself. If each, if everybody would do this, if every, every born again Christian would put their brothers and sisters, put other people before themselves, there wouldn't be any conflict. It wouldn't. If every husband would put their wife before themselves and honor them first, there wouldn't be, and the wife would honor their husband, put them first, there wouldn't be any conflict. I'm not saying you wouldn't have a different disagreement, but you would be able to, you know, honey, it's not worth it. It's not worth to argue and fuss. You know, I love you, and I, you know, I'm putting you first. And you're probably right anyway. That's what I tell my wife. She probably, she, most of the time she's right anyway, so, you know. Amen. Is that right, men? I think you know, any married man, you ought to know that by now, right? Amen. So, so we, uh, not to think of himself more highly, but to put other people, even Paul writing 1 Corinthians in the 13th chapter, in the love chapter, I can't remember the exact verse, but you know, he talks about not, uh, always looking for the good in people. I mean, as always, you can always find something good about anybody. I know it's hard sometimes. You might look at me and say, I don't know about him, but it's, it's hard sometimes. But there is something good, you know. And always don't think of the worst in people. You know, just put them, put their feelings first before your own. All right, Acts 10, 38. But before I even read that scripture, I want to say this. The one person, the one person who is our standard, and should be our standard, did this very thing. He was a living sacrifice before he became the Lamb of God and went to the cross. He was a living sacrifice. Everything that the Lord Jesus did, he did. He, he listened. He did just exactly what he heard from the Father. He said what he heard from the Father, and he lived to serve. Okay? He put, as he walked this earth all the way, from the time that he was there in the River Jordan and was baptized by John the Baptist and the Holy Spirit came down as a dove and anointed him and he led into the desert. He was led into the desert and was tempted of Satan. And you know what? We have several different accounts. We have several different things he was tempted of, but I'm sure there were probably a lot more for 40 days and 40 nights. I'm sure it was a lot more than probably what is even recorded there. But he went through all that. He went through all that and never sinned. The God-man, he'd never sinned. He was perfect and entire. And all the way from that time until then he walks into, I'm getting ahead of myself. Hey, I'm going to stop right there because I've got the scripture I want to read to you here in a minute. It talks about that. I think I do anyway. If don't, I'll just... Um, Yeah, yeah, I got it. Anyway, Acts 10, 38. I know it don't make sense why me stopping right there, but I need to stop there. The Acts 10, 38 is talking about Jesus here. The Apostle Paul, no, this is Dr. Luke who wrote Acts. He said, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Went about doing good. Everything that he did was good. Everything he did was to help someone and to give them what they needed, even if they even recognized it or not. And sometimes they didn't. He healed the sick, raised the dead, opened blind eyes. I mean, he was anointed. He said the Holy Ghost was powered. He anointed him. He went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Philippians 2, 1 says, if there, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, any if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, any bowels of mercy, uh, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in all lowliness of mind, let each esteem each other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. When the third verse, he says, um, 
tells us to esteem each other better than themselves. There we go again. This is just part of being a living sacrifice, being selfless, thinking of others, thinking I'm not better than anybody. I don't care who you are in this world. I don't care how much money, how big your house is, how many cars you have or trucks you have or how much equipment you have or um, whatever you may have, diamonds, jewels, whatever. It don't make any of us any better than anybody else. In the sight of God, we're all equal, equal in the sight of God. Because I'm telling you, once we take our last breath, all this stuff, all the stuff's going to be left here for somebody else to worry about, you know. You're not going to take any of it with you. So we should be thinking about not the temporal stuff that's temporary, which we'll only have just a short time anyway. You know, I'm looking at my life. I mean, I'm almost 69 years old. I mean, I don't, I'm getting in the short rows now, which that's okay because you know what? I know my future is not here. My future in the kingdom is with the Lord Jesus, wherever he's at, either in heaven, heaven or back here on this earth for a thousand years, then throughout eternity. You know, we're going to live a lot longer somewhere else than we are down here. And if you know the Lord Jesus, if you're born again tonight, you know that you have a great place. You have a great future. If you don't, you don't. Your future is not good at all. Because you're going to spend eternity either one or two places, either heaven or the lake of fire. One or the other. And you don't want to be there. You don't want to be in the lake of fire. You want to be with the Lord Jesus. And there's only way, one way to be there. And that's faith in him, Amen. trust in him. Okay, all right, back to the living sacrifice. He said, let this mind be in you, the fifth verse, which is also in Christ Jesus. And, what, and we already said what, it, what mind, his attitude, that he came, he spent, you know, he called the 12. And you see his heart all through the New Testament, all through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you see his heart. He loved spending time with them. Wherever he went, he never got frustrated, frustrated. He never acted upon on his emotions. And I know he had emotions. God has emotions. We all have emotions. We've been given emotions to enjoy. But we have to control our emotions. When things, when bad reports come, when the enemy wants to attack our peace, when someone in the flesh wants to attack our peace, when somebody wants to attack our peace, and come against us, we've got to control that emotion to lash out. And we've still got to love. Amen? We've got to love. And sometimes it's just best just to walk away rather than to react. If I acted on every emotion I ever had, I'd probably be in jail. You know? Or somewhere. But not here. And, you know, it's, it's not easy all the time. But... You know, we have the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Ghost living and residing on inside of us. God himself, the living God who came down and took up residence in us. You know, after the temple, like I said, after the, the, the veil was torn, then there was, and Jesus died on the cross. He was raised again after three days. After three days, he walked this earth 40 days. He walked here and a lot of stuff I was going to talk about some of that stuff tonight, but a lot of stuff went on in that 40 days. A lot of good things happened. Okay, after the 40 days, he ascended back to the Father. Amen? He ascended back to the Father. He said, I, go, I have to go to the Father, but I will send you another comforter. I will send you the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead. So when, on the day of Pentecost, it says in Acts, the second chapter, when the day of Pentecost has fully come, the Holy Spirit came down. We had 120 Jesus people Amen. in the upper room. Amen? Amen? I'm trying not to preach here. It's tough. At 120, there in that upper room. And they, and the, because the Lord had told them to go there and tarry there. Now, I'm not even sure they understood exactly everything they were even there for. He said they were there for the promise of the Father, but they understood it. I don't know. I'm not sure. But they found out quickly. I mean, they were there. They were waiting. So they were all of one mind, one accord. They knew they were there for, because Jesus told them to be there and they knew it was going to be good. Now, I'm telling you, when the Holy Ghost, like a, they heard something all of a sudden. Can you hear it? Like a mighty wind, a rushing mighty wind. I remember a book back in the 70s called A Rushing Mighty Wind. Glory to God. That's where I first learned about the Holy Ghost. 
and, and said the Holy Ghost came. He said he sat on them as tongues as a fire. You can imagine, 120 like, lit up like a candle. The fire sitting down on top of their head, 120 of them. 120 got born again that night. 120, think about it, 120 got born again. The Holy Spirit came inside of them. Then they began to speak in other tongues. In languages that they didn't, of, it was known languages, but they began to speak in tongues. But after that, then Peter steps out. He preaches a message. 3,000 get saved. It was like a, in the Old Testament, 3,000 were destroyed there at the mount. 3,000 were destroyed, but that day 3,000 got born again. But in that upper room, 120 of them got born again, including Mary. And the mother of Christ, his, his earthly mother, now, that didn't make her any better. I know there's a church that wants to put her on a pedestal and they pray to her and all this stuff, but I'm telling you, she got born again just like everybody else. And we're going to see her again. And I imagine if she, I'm, she probably shakes her head at the stuff that people, uh, the way they want to lift her up sometimes. But, uh, yeah, she was there. Her other children were there. Born again. These were new creations. These were the first born again, the first new created people after Jesus left. When the Holy Ghost came, the church was born. You know what? You know, Satan's, his apple cart got upset, sure enough, then. Because he thought, well, he thought he destroyed Jesus. Well, he realized that didn't happen because Jesus ascended into the earth. He went down, or descended. He went into the, and, and defeated Satan. Said it made an open show of him at the cross. Made an open show of, of Satan. Defeated him. Took the, death, the keys of death, hell, and the grave. And rose victorious over all these things. Rose victorious. So Satan... He just, I mean, he's, he's, he's a whipped dog. He's a whipped dog again. But the, I'm telling you, the day of Pentecost come, he got whipped again. Then you got, he turned loose 120 right then. They went out and started preaching, and the 3,000 got saved right off the bat. Then, then a few days later, I think it was another 5,000. Then they go on, and there was Stephen. It's on and on. Peter and John, they went out. They were, they were a living sacrifice. I don't even have this in the notes. Peter and John, we went to the temple there at the Gate Beautiful. He spoke to the man. He was, he was sitting there uh, wanting to receive some money, he thought. But he said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. See, Satan hates that, and he hates it today. When you speak the word, when you, when you minister to someone, to minister to people, every one of us are ambassadors. I spoke a week before last. You're all ambassadors. We all have a calling on our lives. And that's part of being a living sacrifice is being self selfless and unselfish that we can minister to people, that we give of ourselves what God has done for us and give a witness and tell and testify of what Jesus Christ has done for you, that he saved you, you've been washed in his blood, the remission of sins, for the remission of sin, you've been justified tonight. Not, your sins are not just covered. I'm telling you, they're washed away. He don't remember them anymore. They're gone. Glory to God. But anyway, that man, that man got up and walked. They told the people. They were all praising him. He told them, said, you know, what name did you do this? We did this in the name of Jesus. He did it. Not them. They just spoke the word. Just spoke the word. Spoke his name. You know what? You've been given authority. You know you've been given the, um, just like a uh, power of attorney. Do you realize that when you become born again, you begin a, given the power of attorney to use the name of Jesus? You've been given that authority, folks. You have. All authority in his name. It's not us. It's Christ in us, the hope of glory. That's what does it. It's his power. Glory to God. Um, anyway, where to get to? There? All right, I got to the, to the gate beautiful. Okay, then there was Stephen. They needed seven. They needed some deacons, so they appointed seven because there were Stephen and Philip. There were two that I recognized the names. Of course, Stephen, you know, he, he preached the gospel. He preached to them, got them all tore up. See, Satan hates that. He hates that. You know, he don't care. He don't care if you mention any other name. He don't even care if you say God. He don't care about it if you talk in anybody else's name. That's why some of these, these jack leg preachers, I'm sorry, they get up there and they want to talk about everything else but Christ. They want to talk about everything but the blood of Jesus. You know, it, just, it ticks me off, really does. Because, you know what, it's just it's a lie. Because Satan hates that. He hates it when we name the name of Jesus Christ 
and talk about the blood because that, that's what did him in. And he knows his time is short. He knows he's done. And he knows that on the day of Pentecost, oh, we were turned loose. We were turned loose. That's why people talk about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You know, that's why it's important. That's when you really turn loose to go out and preach the gospel and to minister. He's giving you power. He said the Holy Ghost comes. You'll be giving you power to preach and to witness all over the earth, wherever he sends you. Glory to God. That's being a living sacrifice, being that unselfish person. is being able to hear him and listen to him and to hear his voice, take the time to listen, and to, then to obey him. And to obey him. If it's nothing more than just giving a brother or sister a phone call, you know, that's a, self, that's a selfless act, just to give them a phone call. It's talking to them here at church is good, but just give them a phone call during the week or, or stop by and see them or, or if someone calls you up and, and says, Brother, I need you to pray with me. I need you to pray with me. That's being, it's taking the time. I know, I know you're all busy. We all. I'm retired, so I got a little time. Not a whole lot, but I stay pretty busy myself. But, but uh, when people call, I knew, I knew a man uh, up until a year ago, or less than a year ago. He would, uh, he would call a friend of his, or friends of his, regularly. He would call them up. And I need to go to the doctor, or I need to go to the store, or I need this, I need to do this. You know what? And the person he called, uh, sometimes they would get a little aggravated. But you know what? It meant something to that man that called. It meant he had no other ride. He had no other way. But it meant something to him. See, I miss that man. I do. But we need to take, we should, each one of us, take time every day if nothing else, just to pray, to lift each other up in prayer, our brothers and sisters here, our, our leadership, our pastors, just to mention their name before the throne. So, Lord, I, I was thinking about, uh, I was thinking about brother, brother John. Lord, I just wanted to, I just want to speak about it. I just want to talk to you about brother John. You know how I love him. I ask you to bless him and his family. And whatever his needs are, Father, just to meet his needs, to be an intercessor, to intercede for one another. That's being a living sacrifice. Not just doing stuff. The doing stuff is great, but praying for one another is one of the greatest things that we can all do. Is to, is to bring one another up before the throne, the throne of grace and faith. Glory to God. I need to move along here. Where did I get to? I don't know where I got to. I think I was in uh, Philippians somewhere. Anyway, let's move on from there. In Matthew 11, 28, 29, 30, this is scripture you all familiar, we're all familiar with. It says, this is Jesus speaking. He said, come unto me. All you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You see here in this scripture here gives a, a description of the humility of Christ. He told, you, he told them, the people he was speaking to there and to us, you know, if you have a heavy burden, if you have something that's weighting you down, if you have care, and these are emotions. You know, if you have the care of the world, depression, just uh, or scared about something, or anxiety, fear, anger, all these different emotions, he said, bring it to me. Bring it to me, and I will give you rest. Because, you know, his... His yoke is easy. A yoke is something that a, that, a, that a beast of burden would, they would put around their neck to carry or to haul something or to pull something. 
You know, back in my day, we had mules. We didn't use oxen. We had mules back in those days. They were oxen. They used, they put these big yokes on them. But a mule, we put a harness on them, leather harness, and he'd pull a plow. So you think about that. We put, we bring, and this, some of this, the weight could be heavy. So I know the yokes of this world, the burdens of this world can be really heavy sometimes uh, for a lot of different reasons which I won't go into. But he says, come to me and learn of me. Okay, what should we learn about him? Well, he says, goes on to say there in the 29th verse, for I am meek and lowly in heart. Meek and lowly in heart. Okay, this is just, he's not a person that was beat down or sad or sorrowful. He was a man of sorrows, the Old Testament says, but he wasn't like this all the time. But he was a person who wasn't boastful. You know, he wasn't saying, hey, look at me. You know, I just raised, I just raised Lazarus from the dead. Look at me. No, he wasn't like that. Or the paralytic, the, t- the four guys let down through the roof. And he said this, they, he saw their faith. But Jesus, there was power. He said there was power there for him to be healed. But he didn't say, look at me. He didn't say, look at me. He was always pointing to the Father. To the Father. And, you know, he wasn't full of pride. And that brings up a point I want to make about pride. And I, I don't know if I have scripture. I may have some scripture. Yeah, I do. Later on, I got some scripture about pride, a couple of them. But I want to ask you a question. Because you hear this all the time. I'm proud of so-and-so. Or God is proud of so-and-so. I'm proud of my children. Show me in God's word where it ever says that God was proud. I'll give you, that'd be a lesson y'all come to. You can come to me. I don't care. Call me. Show me. It ain't there. I'll give you a heads up, but you can look for it. Do a search. Uh, you can go on your phone. It go on your phone. I mean, if you have a Bible app on there. Go in there and put it in pride and see what it takes you. It ain't none of it good. There's no pride in God Amen. at all. Pride is a characteristic of Satan. That's what was found in Lucifer in the very beginning. He was lifted up with pride and said, I will ascend above God, above, above the throne. He wanted to be worshipped, and he still does. So pride is selfish. It's, an, it's really a selfish act. It sounds good. It sounds good. Oh, I am so proud of my kids. You know, I used to say it all the time. Proud of my wife. No. I'm pleased with her. Two times recorded in the New Testament. The first time Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. Look it up. He came up out of the water and a voice, they heard a voice from heaven. He said, this is my beloved son who I'm proud of. No, he didn't say that. With whom I am well pleased. Pleased is different than pride. The second time when the Lord Jesus took Peter and John and James, they went up on the mount, mountain and Jesus was transfigured. And of course, who shows up? There's Elijah and Moses, and he, t- he spoke with them. Then another voice, again, the voice from heaven, the Father, spoke. This is my beloved Son, with him, in whom I am well pleased. Never mentions pride. Pride goes before a fall. And it, anyway, as a little side note there, that's a freebie. And uh, I hope nobody gets mad at me for saying, well, that's silly. No, it's not. Jesus didn't speak idle words. God don't speak idle words. You know what? We're going to give account for every idle word we speak. We are. And people don't like to hear that. Well, yeah, I don't make no difference. I'm going to be proud of my kids anyway. Okay. It's, your, hey, it's a choice. It's your choice. You have a free will, but you will deal with the consequences. Okay? Also, it's your choice whether to become a living sacrifice or not, too. This is a choice. If you want to be a living sacrifice for God and serve him. Okay. Uh, Luke. Luke uh, chapter 4, verse 16. 
through 19. And I'm going to quit here in a minute. And he came to Nazareth. This is Jesus. He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. Now, as I said before, he had just got through. He would got baptized in water into Jordan. The Spirit anointed him. He was anointed. He had the Holy Spirit without measure. He was full. He was fully baptized in the Holy Ghost. And after that, he was led into the desert where he was tempted of Satan. But Satan had nothing in him. He had nothing for him. Trust me. He had nothing for the Son of the living God. He was ready for him. Because every time and he would quote Scripture, hey, Satan knows Scripture better than we do. He tried to quote some Scripture to him, but it didn't work. Jesus had always had an answer. All right, after he left there, after he left there, he came and came into Nazareth, Nazareth. Where he was brought up, it says here in the 16th verse, and it was a custom. He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. Now, historically, um, I read this, that this Sabbath day was actually the first day of Jubilee, the 50-year 50, 50 Jubilee. This was the first day of that. That's significant. Here's Jesus coming into the synagogue, and he makes a statement, a profound statement. He quotes Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. Okay? So he went into the synagogue, synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. Now keep in mind, this is the year of Jubilee, just beginning. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, which is Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And I, I, read, I read this, I, I wanted to read this because of the things that he said, Isaiah said that he was going to do. And this fulfilled that scripture. And it fulfilled that scripture in their ears, and they didn't like it. The Pharisees never liked it. They never liked when Jesus stood up and told them the truth. And they just marveled at his wisdom and his knowledge of the word. But he was the word and still is, the living word. See, so come, and what a selfish, selfless, not selfish, but selfless thing here. We think about living sacrifice. He's anointed me. And, you know, we think of Luke 10, 38, how he's anointed and went about doing good. Anointed with the Holy Ghost and went about doing good. Here he came, he said, he, he said, I came. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted. And he's the only one that could. To preach deliverance to the captives and recover of sight to the blind and to set at liberty them that are bruised. Think about it. He came to heal the brokenhearted. To preach deliverance to the captives. Who are the captives? The captives are people who were of the world at that time who were not born again. They couldn't be born again at that time. Israel was held captive really by the teachings of the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin and those religious leaders of that day. They were in their sin. They were captive. They were held captive by sin. They come to tell them, said, I've come to set you free. And they didn't know what he was talking about. They had no idea. And of course, the brokenhearted, think about it. These are emotions. Brokenheartedness is a, an emotion. He come to heal them. No doctors can do this. None still can't do it. Amen. No medical doctors, no psychiatrists, psychologists, or nobody can heal a broken. We can't. We cannot. We can listen and have empathy, but we cannot heal a broken heart. Only Christ can. He bore our griefs and took our sorrows, Isaiah 53 says. He's the only one. What a selfless thing here as he walked among men here those 30-some years, 30 years before he went to the cross, went about doing good and everything he did, a living sacrifice every day. Mm. All right, 19 verse said, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Okay, do you know part of that scripture is missing? If you look up, if you look up Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2, who can tell me the... the Last couple of words, two or three words there. Now I'll tell you why they're missing. I don't have my Bible up here with me. I should have, but I didn't. Because I had all the scripture written out. But um, who can tell me?
I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Speak loud. Just tell me the last couple of words, two or three words there, that's the second verse. After the acceptable. Yes, that's what I'm looking for. After the acceptable year of the voice, says the day of vengeance of God. And then what? Comma, then what? The day of vengeance of our God, comma, what? Comfort all that mourn. Okay, there's a comma there between that acceptable year than this scripture. You know what? There's 2,000 years. That comma right there represents 2,000 years, even though there were no punctuations in the Bible. Now, I'm, Debbie, you're looking at what are you talking about? All right, let me explain that. The acceptable year is when he came. Vengeance is when he comes back the second time. The first part of that is the first time. That's why he didn't, he didn't finish that quote. He didn't finish that scripture there in Luke. He stopped after the acceptable year. After the acceptable year of the Lord. He stopped right there. He didn't finish. He, he, that's half of the scripture. Why didn't he quote it? Because it hadn't been done yet. The first part, yes, because he's here. He came this first time to accomplish this. This was the acceptable year of the Lord. But vengeance of God is when he returns the second time. He'll pour out, of course, his wrath being poured out during the tribulation time, during the tribulation period. Then when Christ comes, in the glory, in the clouds of glory, and he comes back to the earth, the Antichrist, the false prophet, they will be destroyed. Vengeance is mine, saith God. He will destroy them. They will be cast into the lake of fire. Then Satan will be cast into the bottomless pit for a thousand years. Now, the other part, the other part is where he's comforting, actually comforting Israel. Is the comfort for Israel. So you have two different things. That's why I said the comma is a 2,000-year gap. From when Christ till now. Of course, we hadn't seen him come the second time yet. But we believe the rapture, when he comes to catch the church away, is very soon, is in, at the appointed time. Every one of these things here happened at an appointed time. They happened at the set time that God predestined from the very beginning of time, from the foundations of the world. He knew he had an appointed time that Jesus would be conceived by the Virgin Mary. He had an appointed time that he would be born. He had an appointed time that he would be baptized there in the River Jordan. He had an appointed time that he would walk into the tabernacle, into the temple, and say, in quotes, Isaiah the prophet. An appointed time. And I'm telling you, there was an appointed time that he'd go to the cross of Calvary and die for our sins. There was an appointed time that he would be raised from the dead the third day. There was an appointed time when the Holy Ghost came on the day of Pentecost. Then 120, 220 people became little Jesus people, little Jesus men and women to preach the gospel. There was an appointed time. There was an appointed time for you and me to be saved, to be born again. Did you know that? He saw that. He saw that from the very beginning of the time. It was an appointed time for each one of us. He called us, and we accepted the call. And we became just like those 120. We became new creations, a new species. Ambassadors, glory to God. New, new. Think about who you are. You don't think, we don't think about that enough. I know we talked a little bit uh, last time about who we are in Christ. Think about who you are, though, really. You're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Your sin is not imputed to you. It's not held against you. You've been washed in his blood, been made clean and righteous, holy and acceptable to God that you can come into his presence with faith and approach him and talk to him just like we're talking right now. My Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you, Lord, and I love you, Lord. I love you, and I just want to come and tell you I love you, and I want to talk, I want to, talk to you about my friends and my brothers and sisters. And I just want to fellowship with you and have fellowship with you. That's why it's important. I'm getting into my other message now. That's why it's so important, according to 1 John 1, 9 and 1 John 2 and 1, if we commit a sin. We, our fellowship is broken, that we need and is hindered. That's why we need to come to him and confess it because we have an advocate. We have an advocate sitting on the right hand of God right now. He's our advocate. 
He's our advocate general, just like, a, like an attorney. said, he is mine, and I forgive him because he's confessed it, and we have fellowship. He can come back into the throne room without guilt. There's no sense of guilt, and your heart does not condemn you then. It's always good when we're going to make mistakes. It's always good to come clean before the Father. We're always, you know, we're accepted in the beloved tonight. Glory to God. We're accepted by the precious blood of the Lamb. Glory to God. Hallelujah. <clears throat> okay. All right. I ought to quit right there. You know what? Huh? Yeah, I, you know, I've got some other scriptures, but, you know, it's, the Lord says that's enough. He says that's enough because it's, somebody was repetitive. And I was actually going to talk about, mention three guys who were full of pride and selfishness. But I'll let y'all read about them on your own. And it's, it's called, in the book of Jude, actually, I'll, I will tell you where to find it, uh, part of it anyway. Um, Jude 1, 11. Jude only has one chapter, so Jude 1, 11. It talks about, he mentions a guy named, uh, uh, Cor um, of course, Cain. You know all know who Cain is. Cain and Abel, the first two children of uh, Adam and Eve. He mentions Cain there. Um, a guy named Balaam and a guy named Korah. Now, I spelled it a little different because the Old Testament spells Korah, K-O-R-A. The New Testament, there in Judah, he spells it C-R-E, like Kor, but it's Korah. All right, who they were, of course, you know who, who Cain was. Uh, you know, Cain, he was selfish. You know, he wanted his way, and he didn't, uh, he had no intentions of being a, a living sacrifice. That's why I was tied all this in. 